Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. If you feel at any time you need support, please contact your local crisis centre. For suggested phone numbers for confidential support, please see the show notes for this episode on your app or on our website. This episode deals with violence towards children. It won't be suitable for all listeners. Please go ahead, Telstra. Thank you. Also requiring ambulance, Eight five three seven one seven. Thank you. Police emergency. This is Tim. Hello, I need an ambulance. What suburb? What suburb? Epimorph. Epimorph. North. Just let me find it here. What corner street's closest? Uh, um, close to, uh, um, back street. Close to? Um, Epimorph, uh, pa- uh, Oval Park. Hello? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm not sure someone I think you're <laughs> I think you I'm not sure. You need to tell me why you need an ambulance. What's wrong? Yeah, I think someone's dying. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? I don't know. You, you need to tell me something. You're asking for an ambulance, but why? Yeah, I don't need a place. Please. Yeah, why? What's wrong? Because I think, think someone was dying. Yeah, you need to say why. What have you seen or heard <laughs> that makes you think someone is going to die? Why don't you do that? Why what is wrong? Oh, Don't scream. Just answer my question. What's wrong? Wait a moment, Alicia. I'm scared. Someone, I have something. Can I talk to someone else? Is there anyone else there? No, I. Uh, Who's in the background talking? Leave me. I just need some help. I don't need some help. I've got to put it away, but you need to tell me what's wrong. Yeah, I need mean, to. You know, someone to, to be killed. I'm is someone sure. bleeding? Is someone unconscious? <laughs> I think they died. Why? Why? I some, I'm not sure that maybe someone killed killed my my um, my brother's family. No. Why did you do that? Why? 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 Please go to Telstra. Two five one four three eight. Thank you, police emergency. This is Tim. Hello, how are you? Yeah, what's I'm your address? Epping North. Epping North. What's wrong? I need someone to come quick. Yeah, we are coming. You need to stop screaming and tell me what the problem is. Yeah, I think my, my brother's family, someone killed my brother's family. Why do you think that? Yeah, because I went to his, his house and uh, I knocked the door and the door is, um, just closed and opened it. And then up the stairs, I found my brother, I couldn't find it. I'm not sure. Where's your brother? I, someone, I could, I could find it. My brother, she said, no, I think someone is dying. Are they on the ground? Oh, pardon? Are they on the ground? No, 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 they're uh, the bedroom, they're all the bedroom. Are they, are they in the house? Is your brother in the house? I'm not sure, because I just have a quick look at him. He's just so, just, 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 the body, I know, I'm just going to have to call you. <laughs> have you found, have, we are driving there. Answer my question, please. Have you found uh, a body? I, I'm, at, at my brother's home. Have you found a body? Because I went to his home and upstairs, he came here because, uh, um, but he he jumped in the open and then the, he said the, 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 the agent and someone has called me and asked I just go to check and uh, I found it <laughs> quick. We are driving there. Don't say quick. Tell me what's wrong. Have you seen your brother? I I'm not sure because the uh, middle I just I found We're already coming. driving there. You don't need to worry. We're on the way. But can you see your brother? I'm not sure. No, it's yes or no. Can you see no, him? I, I, no. Is he in the house? Pardon? Is your brother in the house? I'm not sure. No, it's yes or no. Have you seen him no, in the I, house? No, I didn't see. I didn't see him. But what, why do you think he's dead? I'm a bit confused. Because I thought of my brother just saying, Lord, the body, and they sort of um, just saying, Lord, this was the body, and they sort of two cousins, and the two, um, I, two my brother's son's body. So I thought they up there. I didn't see my brother. Are they, can you see their body? Yeah, I saw. Quick, quick, quick. We're coming, we're on the way, you don't need to worry, we're on the way. I know, the way. ambulance, I'm not sure they're by or not. No, we're, ambulance are on the way as well. Okay, thank you, thank you much. 
police are in the street now. They'll be there in 10 seconds. Are you outside the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you out the front? Outside the... Yeah, front. Inside way. Can you see the police? Yes, they're driving there right now. They'll have their lights on. The Lin family were tight-knit, a strong family who did everything together. They were happy and truly grateful for their life that hard work and perseverance had allowed for them in North Epping, in the northern suburbs of Sydney, New South Wales. Min Lin, aged 45, and his wife Yun Li Lin, also known as Lily, aged 43, migrated to Australia from China as students. They met in Sydney, fell in love, and began a life together. Min opened a news agency on the local Epping shopping strip. It was a busy and successful business. He was well known in the community and was a daily fixture in many lives. By 2009, the Lin's business was thriving, turning over a million dollars a year. Min had also purchased two other commercial properties on the same shopping strip. He was known around Epping as a friendly, hard-working family man. Although English was his and Lily's second language, people found the Lins easy to talk to. They owned a two-storey home nearby where they lived with their three children and Lily's sister, Yun Bin, also known as Irene. Irene was 39 years old and worked part-time in Min and Lily's news agency to help them out. Brenda was the eldest of the Lin children. She was 15 and in year 10. They also had two boys, Henry, aged 12, and Terry, aged 9. The Lin siblings were very close and spent a lot of time together. Brenda was a studious and intelligent Year 10 student with a tight circle of friends and a happy outlook. Henry and Terry enjoyed school and playing sport. Henry played tennis and badminton and had a hard-working and friendly personality much like his father. He also enjoyed learning magic tricks. Min spent every day running the news agency. Even if it was close, he was still usually doing something like restocking. Lily worked there part-time while making sure she was home for the family. Min and Lily's goal was to give their children the best educations and the best life they possibly could. Hard work was not something that was discussed around the dinner table. It was just the way they were. Min and Lily grew up without, so they wanted to give everything to their children. Min's sister, Kathy, who also worked part-time at the news agency, lived nearby with her husband Robert Z and their young son. Kathy and Robert first arrived in Australia in 2002. They moved to Melbourne where Robert opened a restaurant. Robert had wanted to bring over three chefs from China but was denied and the restaurant failed. In 2005, Robert and Kathy made the move to Sydney to be closer to Min and Lily. Robert had been an ear, nose and throat specialist in China before they migrated to Australia. Although they hadn't quite had the success in Australia they imagined, Robert and Kathy had the work ethic to keep going and make it work. They were very close to Min, Lily and their three children. They did a lot together. Henry practiced badminton with his uncle Robert every chance he got. The two families looked after each other and helped each other any way they could. Min and Kathy's parents, Ye Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu, lived close by in Maryland's a suburb in Sydney's west, around 30 minutes' drive from both Min and Kathy. Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu lived for their family. In mid-July 2009, as part of her French class at school, Brenda flew to New Caledonia on a school excursion to practice French. At 15 years old, Brenda was apprehensive about going overseas for a week without her family. The night before she left, she told her mum, Lily, that she was going to miss her and that she loved her. She gave Henry a hug and said the week would go fast and she'd be back soon. Min drove Brenda to the airport at 4am on Monday morning and the two of them watched as Brenda's classmates stood in tears saying goodbye to their families. Brenda thought it was a bit over the top. She held her head high and acted cool. It was only a week. No need for tears or gushy goodbyes. Brenda and Min said goodbye without a dramatic hug or an I love you. 
It wasn't that they didn't love each other. They just didn't need to say it. They knew. On the evening of Friday, July 17, 2009, the Lin and Z families had a get-together at Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu's house in Marylands. It was a typical family dinner. Brenda was still away in New Caledonia, so the focus was on the two boys, Henry and Terry. Henry complained to his grandparents that his shoes were broken, but he was happy when his grandmother gave him $50 for winning his badminton competition. She tried to twist his arm into sleeping over at their place, but Henry insisted on staying at home, as he had another badminton game in the morning. It was a happy and harmonious evening. When everyone left to go home, they saw it was a particularly dark night. There was barely a moon. The following morning, July 18, 2009, Min's sister, Kathy Lynn, and her husband, Robert Z, were up early. Their home was close by to Min and Lily, just over the park. Robert had been up early cleaning his garage. While he was doing that, Kathy received a phone call. Min and Lily's news agency hadn't been opened that morning. The news agency was always open on time, especially on Saturdays, the busiest morning on the shopping strip. People were standing out the front of the news agency staring at a huge pile of papers still bundled on the footpath, and when they tried the door, it was locked. Immediately fearing something was wrong, Kathy and Robert went straight over to Min and Lily's house. They assumed they were either sick, or maybe one of the boys had hurt themselves. When they arrived, they found the front door unlocked. Robert and Kathy entered the house and called out, but no one responded. They slowly made their way up the stairs. Kathy opened her brother and sister-in-law's bedroom door, located to the right at the top of the stairs. Robert was following close behind. All they saw was red. Blood all over the bed, blood all over the walls. It was everywhere. Kathy looked down at the bed and saw a body, which she knew instantly was her sister-in-law, Lily. Robert pulled her from behind, trying to shield her from the horror. Kathy ran out and made her way to the next room. It was the bedroom of Lily's sister, Irene. The door handle was bloody, and the door was ajar. Inside her room, the scene was no different. Blood everywhere. For a moment, Robert thought Irene may have still been alive, and his instinct was to reach out for her. Lastly, at the end of the first floor corridor, Kathy and Robert walked towards the shared bedroom of their two nephews, Henry and Terry. What they saw was a mirror image of what they found in the first two rooms. They ran downstairs to call triple zero. It was Kathy you could hear in the emergency call at the beginning of the episode. The call is a mix of panic and confusion. Kathy struggled to get her mind straight in the grief of seeing her family murdered. At first, Robert can be heard in the background, but then in an obvious state of shock, he told Kathy he was going to leave the house to go and get her and Min's parents from their Maryland's home. Kathy can be heard pleading with Robert in Cantonese not to leave her alone in the house. She was scared. Kathy said to the operator she hadn't seen her brother Min, and with everything a blur, she considered the possibility that he might have murdered his family and fled. But she wasn't sure. Maybe he was there. Kathy was left shaking, and Robert, clearly frightened, had run from the scene. Kathy can be heard saying, I am more scared than you are, in Cantonese, before he left. Robert left and called his in-laws, Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu, and told them that something terrible had happened. When they asked what had happened, Robert couldn't say. He just said that they should get on a train as soon as possible. Then he changed his mind and said he would go and get them. Robert was panicking. When police and paramedics arrived at the scene, they didn't know what they were walking into. Kathy's frantic emergency call indicated there was likely at least one body, and it wasn't known if the killer was alive or dead. They had no idea what had happened or what to expect. 
Kathy was standing out the front of the property, screaming in a frantic state when they arrived. Inside, as they opened the front door, they found a simple family home cluttered with daily life. The downstairs study and living area filled with books, papers and a walking machine. The family's shoes lined up at the foot of the stairs. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Police headed up the stairs and into the first bedroom, which was Min and Lily's. They were confronted with a room so red and so bloody, it was at first difficult to determine if there was a body. When those officers went to work that morning, not one of them was prepared for a family beaten to death beyond recognition in a quiet residential area, not known for its violent crime. They went into the other rooms and checked to see if anyone was still breathing. When that was a negative, their thoughts turned to Min. Where was he? Police took guard around the property in case the killer, possibly Min, was still around. When Min's parents arrived at the scene with Robert, they were told by police that their daughter-in-law Lily, her sister Irene, and their two grandsons, Henry and Terry, were dead. With no word as to where Min was, they feared he had either been abducted or he was responsible. But as crime scene investigators arrived, Kathy suggested they look under the doona where Lily was. Kathy said she had seen Min's watch, and she just had a feeling that her brother Min might be under the doona. Upon closer inspection, underneath the blood-soaked doona, they found the body of Min Lin. He was beaten so badly he was unrecognisable. There was blood spatter from floor to ceiling. A phone charger plugged in close to the ground was covered in blood, as was the ceiling's light fitting. The level of violence was extreme. This was no regular break and enter resulting in murder. This was a family murdered beyond recognition. Five people attacked at a time of high vulnerability in the middle of the night. Police cordoned off the street while detectives canvassed neighbours for any information. Robert, Kathy, Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu were taken to Hornsby Hospital to be treated for shock and to receive counselling. It was only then they were formally told that Min had also been found dead. A few hours later, Brenda, who was still in New Caledonia with her class, jumped on the internet with some friends. Brenda told Channel 9's A Current Affair program, quote, We decided we would use the internet and go on Facebook to see what all our friends were doing in the holidays and talk to them and catch up. And then everyone started asking if I was okay. Someone said that my family was murdered, and I couldn't believe it. At first I thought it was just some cruel joke that they were playing on me, and it's not funny. I didn't think that could happen to my family, and at first I guess I felt really dizzy, and I don't know, I was really shocked, and I just couldn't really think or see anything straight. Her school principal, Susan Bridge, made contact with the teachers on the trip, and Brenda was put on the next available flight home. Kathy was at the airport with police officers waiting for Brenda. When Brenda arrived, she was escorted into a special room. When she fell into the arms of her crying Aunt Kathy, she realised it was all true. The gravity of what had happened hit her. Her family was gone. When news broke, the media reported the possibility of the incident being a murder-suicide. Acting Superintendent Stephen Henkel spoke to waiting press at the scene. He confirmed the possibility of murder-suicide and said it was being investigated. When questions were raised over the relationships of the victims and how they died, he declined to comment. Police determined that the murders occurred between 2am and 5.30am. The electricity to the Lynn house had been cut, and it was likely that if someone had entered from the outside, a key was used to gain access, as there was no sign of forced entry. An examination of the house showed no obvious signs of theft. A makeshift hammer-like weapon was determined to be the murder weapon, but it wasn't located. None of the injuries were deemed to be self-inflicted. This was definitely not a murder-suicide. The severity of the injuries initially led police to believe a gun had been used, but post-mortem examinations showed otherwise. 
as well as blunt force trauma. Asphyxia was a contributing cause of death in four out of five of the victims. The likely scenario was that Min and Lily were killed first, possibly suffocated to subdue them, and then beaten. The level of brutality inflicted on both Min and Lily showed they had received the most violent attacks of all the victims. Lily's sister Irene was killed in the same manner. The killer then went to Henry and Terry's bedroom, where it's believed that at least one of the boys was already awake, woken up by what was happening in the neighbouring bedrooms. It was apparent from blood spatter patterns that there had been a furious struggle. The boys had fought with their killer. Blood was found smeared on all of the bedroom door handles, except for Brenda's. Her door and room hadn't been touched. The blood smears showed it was likely the murderer was wearing gloves. 24 bloody shoe impressions were found, measured to be men's US size between 8.5 and 10.5. On July 22nd, 2009, four days after the murders, Robert and Kathy were interviewed by police. The interview room at Parramatta Police Station was painted grey with four chairs around a white desk. During Robert's interview, he sat with his interpreter, sipping water from a plastic disposable cup, while two detectives asked him questions and took notes. Almost 35 minutes into the interview, Robert sits with his hands clutched together on the table. His head is down and he begins to slowly wring his hands. He struggles to explain what he saw. Although he can manage broken English, he continues in his native Cantonese so he can speak fluently and doesn't need to stop to find the right words. His answers are short and sometimes confused. He speaks in a quiet tone, barely lifting his eyes from the desk as he describes finding the bloodied remains of his family. He describes how the night before, after being at the family dinner, he and Kathy returned home. He spent the rest of the night watching cycling, cricket and movies before having a bath around 2am and then going to bed. He then describes the scene he and Kathy walked into. He explains that he was telling Kathy not to look at the bodies. He rubs his face with his hands, rubbing his eyes and massaging his forehead. When Robert gets to approaching the bedroom that Henry and Terry were in, he struggles to get his words together. It's a moment when it seems he might break down. I, I can see everywhere it was red. Red, red and everywhere. I think I saw my sister in law first. Um, once I saw her, I I I hold Kathy and I said, Kathy, don't don't look at it. But I believe Kathy had already seen. You know, he he told um, and I saw that um, the best side, uh, which is close to the door, mm-hmm. I saw this side, I saw uh, a, a, a staff, um, a group of staff, I think it was her brother. Uh, this, it's like a pile of I but I just feel it was so red and um, messy everywhere. No. Um, 
，我哋就行出嚟，係我喺呢邊行，我行先，跟住出咗嚟。And so we went out from the room. I went out with Kathy. 然後我哋就跑去誒、呃、另外嗰啲房間度。We ran. We ran to the other room. 睇到誒、呃、樓梯過嚟。以前個屋地圖上 ，Terry 嗰個房係關住嘅。I saw、um, the Terry's room. I indicated before used to be Terry's room. The door was closed. 嗯。嗯。嗯。嗯。嗯。係關住嘅。The doors closed。應該係 Kathy 推開門。Kathy， 嗯、um, ，Kathy push open the door。我哋見到 Irene 喺牀上邊。We saw Irene on the bed。嗯。亦都係周圍都好多血，好紅。Uh, Also, a lot of blood around, very red. Uh, I, I go up to, uh, touch him. I, because I want to know if he is still alive. I try to touch her. I, I went closer. I try to touch her because I want to know whether she is still alive. 因為我覺得佢唔，佢當時我睇到佢唔係完全平攤喺牀上。Because I, when I saw her, she was not just lie down on the bed flatly. Um. 所以我想試一試。So I want to try. 不過 Kathy 拉住我。But um, Kathy, uh, hold me back. 所以我好可能係冇掂到佢。So I think I did not. Actually, touch, touch her. Then we came out. Then we came out again. Then we came out again. We reached the last bedroom. Uh, That's Henry's bedroom. I indicate on the map. That door, like it was half closed. The 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 door was half closed. Not sure. I'm not sure. Then we went to see. We entered the room. Same as before. 一眼睇到係兩個細路仔喺地下度。Oh, we can see、uh, both children、uh, were lying on the floor。亦都係覺得好多血，可能好好紅。Also feel very red and blood all around。好亂嘅感覺。Messy。然後我又係好想去摸下佢哋，睇下佢哋係咪仲活住，因為兩個細路仔。I again I want to touch them, um, because they are just little kids. Um, I really want to know whether they are still alive or not. 我記得我係伸右手去嘗試去掂佢哋。I remember I tried to reach them by my right hand. 我真係唔好記得啦。But I can't remember. 然後應該係 Kathy 拉住我走，我哋應該走啦。Kathy， 嗯 ，help me back， 跟住。一路叫，好驚咁一路大聲叫。She kept yelling, "Let's go, let's go!" She was so frightening. 當然我都好驚。I I was afraid as well. During Kathy's interview, she was calm. Her descriptions were hushed but clear. Robert and Kathy became legal guardians of Brenda. She moved into their home 
and they tried to give her some sense of normality. They also took over the running of the news agency that had now become a shrine for the Lynn family. Locals filled the footpath with flowers and tributes. Brenda, quote, I still wake up each morning thinking, oh yeah, mum and dad are going to be downstairs making breakfast and Henry and Terry will be playing on the computer or something. I don't think right now I realise what has happened. I think sometime soon everything will just come crashing down on me and I'll finally realise. The murders shocked the community. No one had noticed anything unusual in the lead up or felt anything strange was going on. Many neighbours had bumped into the Lynn family in the days leading up. People were shocked that such a friendly, normal family had been targeted in such a brutal and callous way. No one could make sense of it, and despite a thorough investigation, police had no leads. On August 8th, a public funeral was held for the whole family. Five coffins covered in white flowers stood in a row in front of hundreds of mourners. Each coffin had a framed photo sitting on top. Orange-robed Buddhist monks led the procession. The grief was felt by everyone who attended, even members of the police who were there. Brenda showed her immense strength by keeping stoic and supporting her grandparents and auntie and uncle. Brenda still admitted that the loss of her parents hadn't yet sunk in. She still felt it was all a bad dream and that she would wake up and find everything was okay. Police deliberated over whether or not Brenda had been spared intentionally or if she was still a target of a killer who didn't know she was away for the week. They also had questions about Henry and Terry. Were they part of the original plan or had they been killed out of necessity, perhaps because they woke up and saw the killer? Without knowing for sure, it was important to keep a close watch over Brenda for her own protection. Following the funeral, a trust fund was set up to secure Brenda's future education. The community rallied around her. Robert and Kathy became her substitute parents. Brenda called them the next best thing to her family and described how they were looking after her and taking her to school and making her lunches. Strike Force Norburn was established to investigate the Lynn murders. The Strike Force was comprised of detectives from the State Crime Command's Homicide Squad with assistance from the Eastwood Local Area Command. Almost a month after the murders, the strike force received information that an arrest had been made in Parramatta, which they believed was linked to a number of violent armoured car robberies. These robberies took place around Epping and surrounding suburbs early in the morning, while vans were on their rounds to fill up ATMs. Why this was of interest is because on May 28th, only two months before the murders, Min Lin witnessed one of these armed robberies. The robbery occurred at the Epping Club, a local RSL, which was directly across the road from Min's news agency. Police started investigating that angle to see if they could find a link. The pressure on investigators to find the killer or killers was immense. The case was one of the largest single homicides in New South Wales history. It had shocked the entire country. The investigation was led by Sergeant Joseph Marie. Marie was known for his very quiet demeanour and an approach to his work that was calm. He was never hurried or stressed. A fellow senior officer said of him, quote, He's very, very quiet. I've never seen him or heard of anyone seeing him getting stressed or worried or concerned by anything. He's got a Buddhist monk thing about him. He's an enigma. He's a legend. They identified several persons of interest, but one by one they were crossed off the list. They were also able to rule out any connection between Min witnessing the robbery and his murder. That line of inquiry was looked at thoroughly, but it was determined to be nothing more than a coincidence. Detective Marie and his team had their sights set elsewhere. They firmly believed the killer was part of the family. They believed the killer knew the layout of the house. They knew where the electricity box was, and they may have even known where to find a spare key. Or, they already had one. The bloody shoe impressions found at the scene indicated the killer acted alone. Eventually, they felt there was only one person worth watching more closely. Robert Z. 
Robert's behaviour in the months after the murders puzzled police, and once he was granted power of attorney over Brenda and her family's estate, it was difficult to not question his motives. Detectives were aware that after the murders, Min and Kathy's parents, Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu needed emergency housing because they were evicted from their home. The home they lived in was purchased for them by Min, so it belonged to the Lin family estate, which means they were evicted by Robert. Why would Robert evict Brenda's grandparents, his own mother and father-in-law, from their home Brenda's father had purchased for them? A theory at the time was that by evicting them, it reduced the options for Brenda. She couldn't decide to leave Robert and Kathy's and live with her grandparents if they didn't have a home. The strike force was faced with a serious dilemma. Their number one priority was the safety of Brenda, who was now in the care of their number one suspect. They conducted a number of risk assessments, after which they didn't think Robert would harm Brenda, if he was in fact the killer. If Robert was the killer and had wanted to harm Brenda as well, then he could have just waited until she was back from her trip. Hers was the only bedroom not touched, and police believed the killer knew she wasn't there. Still, they needed to be assured of Brenda's safety, so they started covert video surveillance inside the house. It was the start of a six-month electronic surveillance operation on Robert Z. Little pinhole cameras were set up throughout his home, and the New South Wales Crime Commission assisted with the operation. In March 2010, eight months after the murders, Robert made a call to Detective Sergeant Joseph Marie. He wanted to clarify something he had said previously. Robert said he may have told a police officer at the scene there were five bodies in the house, but in fact, he meant four or five. This phone call strengthened police suspicions of Robert Z. They believed he knew from the outset there were five bodies, not four. When Min's body hadn't been found in the very beginning, and he was actually considered a potential suspect at one stage, police felt Robert knew exactly where he was, and that he was the one who pushed Kathy to tell police to look under the doona. They met with Robert at Ride Police Station for another interview on March 16th, 2010. Do you know anything about the murders of Min Lin and his family? Anything else about? Yeah. No idea. Have you got any idea who may have been responsible for the murders? I don't know. Have you thought about who may have been responsible? No. Do you have any idea why someone would have done this to Min and his family? No. No idea. In early May, the New South Wales Crime Commission interviewed Cathy. She denied that Robert had told her to tell police to look under the doona for Min's body. She was adamant that she simply had a feeling he was under there. She was informed about the 24 bloody chew impressions that were found at the scene, showing a men's shoe size between US 8.5 and 10.5. And They also told her that the shoe impressions were linked to one of three specific models of ASICS trainers. One of those models was called ASICS Gelovation, which hadn't been produced since 2005. They asked Kathy what type of shoes Robert wore. Just days later, on May 7th, 2010, investigators watched the video surveillance inside Robert and Kathy's home. The view is from above the kitchen on a far wall. You can see through the kitchen over into a study area with a couple of desks and computers. Kathy is sitting at one desk, watching as Robert stands at the other, his back to the camera. A cutting sound can be heard over and over. Robert is cutting something into little pieces and placing the pieces into a plastic bin containing liquid. Apart from the repetitive sound of the cutting, there is silence. Upon closer inspection of the video, Detectives realise that Robert is cutting up an ASIC shoebox from his men's US size 9.5 ASICs trainers. Robert picks up the bin and walks into the kitchen towards the camera, then walks past it. Then, the sound of a flushing toilet can be heard. 
A few days later, police began what was a five-day search of Robert and Kathy's home. They knew that Robert had been up early cleaning his garage the morning the bodies were found. While combing his garage for any forensic evidence, crime scene investigators moved a chest of drawers. On the floor underneath was a stain, a discoloration of the concrete measuring two centimetres by six centimetres. It was photographed, swabbed and labelled Stain 91. Stain 91 was found to be a complex DNA mixture. Capabilities in Australia to establish DNA from mixed samples weren't quite there yet, so they sent the sample to a specialty lab, Cybergenetics in Pittsburgh, USA. They kept Robert under surveillance while waiting for the result. Meanwhile, it had gotten out that Robert was the prime suspect. People were talking. Brenda was interviewed in the local Northern District Times, and she was adamant that her uncle was innocent. She said, quote, He was really stressed and really upset because we know it's not true, and he doesn't like to think that people around him might think that way about him. He has helped me so much, and he really supports Kathy and has done so much for us. It's not fair that people in the media are making out like he might have something to do with it. Police reassured the public that the investigation was still active and that progress was being made towards finding the killer. Brenda's school principal, Susan Bridge, had become a firm fixture in Brenda's life. While Brenda was supported at home by her auntie, uncle, grandparents and extended family, she also found comfort at school from her peers and teachers. After having lunch with Brenda and her uncle Robert one day, something didn't sit right with Susan Bridge. She noticed that Robert was overly firm with Brenda, and it appeared like he was trying to force her into saying something. The interaction wasn't normal. Susan was unsure what to do, but she talked Brenda into speaking with a lawyer, and she also spoke to the police. She wanted someone neutral who could help Brenda understand the relationships around her. Police eventually got what they were waiting for from the US lab Cybergenetics. The testing of Stain 91 from Robert's garage was extremely complex because it was a mixed sample. If it was even just a few years earlier, the sample would have been dubbed too difficult to determine. But the technology was now there. According to Cybergenetics, Stain 91 was found to contain DNA of at least four of the five murder victims, with Terry Lynn's DNA matching part of the stain with a 1 in 50 quadrillion chance of it coming from another person. They were also able to match Stain 91 to a blood spot on a mattress from the murder scene. On May 5th, 2011, nearly two years since her family was murdered, Brenda Lynn was called to the principal's office at her school just after 9am. She was greeted by her principal and two detectives from the strike force whom she knew. They told Brenda that her uncle Robert had just been arrested for the murders of her parents, her aunt, and her two brothers. At the same time, another strike force detective phoned Kathy Lynn at the news agency. She was out the back doing paperwork when she got the call. After she hung up, a staff member watched Kathy run from the store crying. Brenda went home to be cared for by her aunt Kathy. Kathy said, I am caring for her and I will always do that. I am okay, thank you, and she is okay. We are shocked, but I don't want to talk about it anymore. Min and Kathy's parents, Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu, were in Shanghai when they received the news, and they flew back to Australia straight away. Robert chose not to appear in the Parramatta local court to hear the charges, nor did he make an application for bail at the time, and it was formally refused by the magistrate. He did make numerous bail applications after this, but they were all refused. While preparing their case, detectives believed that they may have been able to get Robert to confess, if not to them, then to someone else. So the strike force forged a relationship with another inmate at Sydney's Long Bay Jail and devised a plan to record Robert confessing to the murders. The inmate was only identified as Witness A. On February 10, 2012, The real estate agency who originally sold the family home to Min and Lily in 2001 put the house on the market on behalf of the Lynn estate. The agency stated that upon successful completion of the sale, 
any fee they earned would be donated to Brenda. A month later, Robert again applied for bail in the New South Wales Supreme Court. Justice Derek Price denied bail, but did acknowledge that a jury may find there is not enough evidence to convict him. On August 20th, 2012, three years after the murders, Robert's committal trial began. Kathy Lynn was called as a witness for the prosecution, but her evidence over the two days she was on the stand showed she was convinced that her husband was innocent of the murders. Kathy testified that Robert didn't leave the house the night of the murders, but that hadn't always been her story. Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi, QC, quote, On the 20th of July 2009, you claimed that Robert was home all night. In March 2010, you didn't know. And on the 6th of May 2010, you didn't know. And now you claim that you know, and that he didn't leave the house. Is it the case that your memory of what happened on the night of July 17th is better now than it was then? Covert surveillance audio was produced that suggested Robert may have told Kathy and another relative what to tell police following the five murders. Justice Rothman said, quote, This suggests a significant degree of collusion in the evidence that is to be given, and a degree of coaching as to what could and should be said. Those conversations give me serious concern. After a lengthy committal hearing on December 19, 2012, Robert was committed to stand trial for the murders of Min, Lily, Irene, Henry and Terry. Robert's lawyer again applied for bail, but the application was refused. Kathy continued to support her husband, believing he was the scapegoat for someone else's crimes. His trial date was set for September 2013, but as that date drew closer, it was vacated, and the trial was delayed until 2014. On May 8, 2014, almost five years after the murders, Robert's trial began. Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi QC gave his opening statement and the jury were presented with the DNA evidence from Stain 91. They were also presented with a large number of recordings between Robert and Witness A, who were in adjoining cells in Long Bay Jail between July 2011 and February 2013. Some of the conversations between Robert and Witness A were captured on tape, but others were not. It was made clear to the jury that Witness A had received a substantial reduction in his sentence for agreeing to assist police in this investigation. The recordings and testimony from Witness A revealed that Robert admitted he purchased a hammer at a store that he knew didn't have surveillance footage. He said he hid the hammer after the murders and could still access it if required, although he was concerned there could be surveillance footage of him hiding the hammer. He didn't elaborate where he hid it. He wanted to plant another hammer in an innocent man's house, but never got around to it. He said he easily controlled his five victims because he had martial arts training. He then demonstrated a pressure point on the neck. He said he sedated his wife Kathy so he could sneak out of the house without her knowing. Robert spoke negatively about the Lynn family in these conversations, showing his true feelings about them. He told Witness A he didn't want to be the person to discover the bodies because that would make him the prime suspect, but it was unavoidable. The way it played out meant he had to be with Kathy when she found them. Witness A told Robert he had a friend named Harry who was a corrupt cop and he could arrange for Harry to steal someone's DNA from a funeral home and plant it on the murder weapon. Robert made plans with Witness A to make that happen. What he didn't know was that Harry wasn't a corrupt cop. He was an undercover cop. The case against Robert appeared strong. When Brenda Lynn took the stand, she revealed that she had been the victim of ongoing sexual assaults committed by her uncle Robert Z. These assaults started prior to the murders and escalated once she moved in with Robert and Kathy afterwards. She said she didn't reveal this information earlier because she believed her uncle was innocent of the murders. When this information came out in the court, Justice Peter Johnson declared a mistrial. The information from Witness A, 
as well as the information regarding the sexual assaults of Brenda Lynn were suppressed until the new trial. Robert Z's second trial commenced on August 5th, 2014, three months after his first. It was presided over again by Justice Peter Johnson. The DNA evidence was presented to the new jury, as was the evidence from Witness A. The jury heard that vastly more force than necessary was used in order to kill the five victims. They also heard the motive as alleged by the prosecution. Robert was driven by bitterness and loss of face within his family, where he believed his in-laws favoured the hard-working Min and Lily over him. He was also driven by a clear sexual interest in Brenda. Robert wasn't charged over the sexual assaults, but Brenda's evidence was admissible at trial. Brenda's grandmother, Feng Ching Zhu, told a jury she believed her grandson Henry would have stayed over at her Maryland's home on the night of the murders, had it not been for Robert making plans to play badminton with him the following day. She said, I don't know what Robert said to him, but I will regret Henry not staying over for the rest of my life. That is why I hate Robert. He is a wolf under a sheep's skin. He was trying to deceive us, now I realise that. I realise now he is not a human being. He is a monster. Brenda's grandfather, Yang Fei Lin, then took the stand. He confirmed that he and his wife lived with Robert and Kathy for a time after the murders. This was after Robert evicted them from their home. He described how one night he got up to go to the bathroom, and when he returned, he saw Robert standing near Brenda's bedroom. Robert got a fright when he saw him. It was also revealed that shortly after the murders, the surviving family was sent a hoax letter demanding $128,345 for a drug debt. It was later proven that this drug debt didn't exist. On September 23rd, 2014, seven weeks into the second trial of Robert Z, the trial was aborted because Justice Peter Johnson became sick. Robert Z's lawyer again applied for bail but it was denied. On February 4th, 2015, five and a half years after the Lynn family was murdered, and almost four years after his arrest, Robert Z's third murder trial began. This time, it was presided over by Justice Elizabeth Fullerton. The evidence presented by the prosecution followed the same path that the second trial took before it was aborted. The information regarding the sexual assaults and jailhouse confessions to Witness A had again been suppressed after the second trial, so it was the first time the new jury heard the evidence. The third trial ran for 10 months and was the longest in New South Wales history for a single accused. It concluded on November 12, 2015, and the jury began their deliberations. After 19 days, the jury returned to the court with their decision. On December 1st, 2015, they told the court they couldn't reach a verdict, meaning a fourth trial would have to be conducted. Justice Fullerton acknowledged that the time Robert had spent in custody, mostly in solitary confinement, had taken a heavy toll on his mental well-being. She said, For an accused person to remain in custody for five years or more is impossible to view as fair and commensurate with a fair and just criminal process. She agreed to accept a report from a clinical psychologist who stated that Robert was suffering from a severe depressive condition that could prevent him from participating fully in another criminal trial. She rejected the Crown Prosecutor's argument that Robert was a flight risk and that if he was released, there was a risk he would attempt to intimidate witnesses. This time, Robert Z was granted bail. His bail was strict, with 17 conditions in total. His Epping home, worth more than $1 million, had to be put up as bail surety. His sister also had to put up a $100,000 cash bond. He had to surrender his passport, wear an electronic monitoring bracelet, and report to police three times a day. He was only allowed to travel to and from his home for legal or health-related appointments. It took nearly three days to sort out the paperwork for his release before he could leave Silverwater Prison. He was driven home by Kathy in their red Toyota Corolla. 
When they pulled up in their driveway, there was a huge amount of press waiting for them. After being asked how it felt to be home, Robert replied in a quiet, hushed tone, I'm grateful to be home, and I'll continue to fight for my innocence. Thank you. The fourth trial was set to begin the following April in 2016, but it was delayed. It finally started in the Supreme Court of New South Wales on June 29, 2016, seven years after the murders. There was a new defence team representing Robert, and there were also new prosecutors. Robert Z sat in the wooden dock with a composed and often blank expression. He sat quietly as the prosecution described the savage and violent murders for a fourth jury. Occasionally throughout the trial, he gestured mildly towards Cathy or his lawyers with a hint of a smile. The original senior Crown Prosecutor on the case, Mark Tedeschi QC, this time sat in the public gallery with Yang Fei Lin and Feng Ching Zhu. They both wept continuously throughout the entire trial. Like the trials before, the Crown put forward their arguments for guilt. The DNA, known as Stain 91, the conversations with Witness A, Robert destroying his ASIC shoebox after he learnt police matched the bloody footprints in the house to ASIC sneakers, and the fact Robert had a key to the Lynn family home, and intimate knowledge of its layout. Other things came into play as well. Robert made no attempt to check if anyone was alive, despite his medical training, and he left Kathy alone at the house while he went and collected her parents, at a time when they had no idea if the killer was still close by. Crown Prosecutor Tanya Smith told the court that Robert was a, quote, trusted relative who meticulously planned and carried out the killings with an extreme degree of violence. He did so in their bedrooms in a very quiet suburban home in the early hours of the morning, a place where they were all entitled to be safe and secure, and a place where young Terry and Henry, only nine and twelve, should have happily pursued their childhood. The defence argued that Robert had an alibi. He was at home in bed all night with his wife Kathy. They rubbished claims that Robert admitted to Witness A he had sedated Kathy so he could sneak out, and this particular conversation with Witness A wasn't actually recorded, so it was Robert's word against Witness A. In relation to the conversations that were actually recorded, the defence said it was simply jailhouse talk. The defence also attacked the DNA evidence, Stain 91, They said that it couldn't be ruled out that the stain had DNA of other family members in it as well, meaning it couldn't be linked to the crime scene. They also weren't satisfied the stain was blood. The defence said that nothing in Robert's conduct on the day of the murders, or the time after the murders, gave any indication of guilt. He isn't the only person in Australia who wears ASIC sneakers, and just because he destroyed a shoebox doesn't mean he is guilty. Friends of Robert testified and described him as a friendly, gentle and honest family man who loved his nephews and was especially close to Henry. In anticipation of the jury retiring to consider its verdict, Robert Z's bail was revoked and he was taken back into custody on the 22nd of December 2016. The trial and deliberations then went on hold over Christmas. On January 12th, 2017, the jury had reached a verdict. The majority of the 11 jurors found Robert Z guilty of all five counts of murder. Kathy sobbed quietly with her head down as the verdict was read. Robert Z stood up and said, I did not murder the Lynn family, I am innocent. Kathy also cried out, he's innocent. On the other side of the courtroom, Crown Prosecutor Tanya Smith hugged Feng Ching Zhu and Yang Fei Li. Their daughter Kathy continued to support her husband Robert, telling the waiting press, he is innocent. We believe that he is innocent. We will keep fighting for him. Detective Sergeant Marie sat upstairs in the courthouse throughout the four trials. He sat quietly and sometimes as he passed people related to the case, he would give a polite smile or nod. As the guilty verdict was read, he slipped quietly out of the courthouse. His colleague said that was typical of the quiet-natured detective. One of his colleagues said, Had it been anyone else in charge, I don't think they would have made it to the end. 
It then came time for Justice Elizabeth Fullerton to sentence Robert Z. The fact that I am unable to reach a point of satisfaction to the criminal standard as to what in fact motivated him to do what he did does nothing to diminish the gravity of his offending. The commission of a series of intentional and brutal killings of five members of a family, including two children, in their family home in the early hours of the morning whilst they were sleeping or being roused from sleep in a single episode of brutal and calculated murderous violence is a course of offending that can only be described as heinous in the extreme. Would you stand up, please? Lynn Ben Robert Z on counts one to five on the indictment, you are convicted of the murders of Min Norman Lin, Yun Li Lily Lin, Yun Bin Irene Lin, Henry Lin, and Terry Lin. On each count, you are sentenced to imprisonment for life commencing on 25 May 2012. Justice Fullerton went on to support Brenda, stating, I acknowledge the profound grief she has suffered and continues to suffer. I also commend her for her strength and dignity and her courage as she faces the future without parents, siblings or a loving aunt. Brenda had seen Kathy as the most important person in her life after her family's murder. But what had happened over the course of the four trials strained that relationship beyond repair. Brenda Lynn told the Australian newspaper, quote, It's been seven and a half years since I lost my family. That is seven and a half years without a loving mother. Seven and a half years without a loving father. Seven and a half years without two exuberant brothers who were my best and closest friends, and seven and a half years without an extremely kind aunt. In this time I have finished my HSC, was accepted into uni, got my first part-time job and learnt to drive. But I have achieved all of these things without my family beside me. These inherently happy moments are now at most bittersweet. They have now become a painful reminder of the family I have lost and I will never see again.